Okay, so let's get started. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, welcome everybody to the HEAS seminar uh, in ancient genomics. And uh, it's a pleasure to have here today Katarina Gushansky. Uh, she's a senior lecturer, so a professor in Edinburgh at the moment in Scotland, um, where she just moved recently a year ago from the University of Uppsala, where she had a professor position. Um, and while she has a PhD, um, well, she did her PhD at the Max Planck Institute, um, and she has been working on apes, primates, uh, all kinds of monkeys, reindeers as well, <laughs> and some other species. And um, basically, she has worked on population genetics uh, of, of different angles to determine relationships and admixture events between species and on conservation genomics as well, uh, which is a large part of her work, of course, in, in great apes and other primates. Um, and yeah, so in particular focus of her work has also been on the uh, diet and microbiome, which is uh, a very important feature, of course, of the biology of this species, and uh, where we can also maybe learn something about how these species live and adapt, and maybe also how their interaction with humans uh, changed. So um, yeah, we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks, Martin. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for having me. That works with the audio, yeah? You can you can hear me? Perfect. Right. Um, thanks so much for the invite. Um, I have been contemplating what to talk about. And then Martin was like, oh, you need to talk about gorillas. So here we go. I'll be talking about gorillas. Um, I'll try to give you an idea of two research themes that we're covering in uh, my lab. But before I get to that, I actually want to give you just a small teaser of a third research theme that I will not be talking about. But I know from talking to some of you already that there is quite a lot of interest in the general topics and general concepts. And this is a um, topic that my, shall I just get this one? Will it disappear if I go yeah. to, ooh, which one? Down? No? Up? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Two more. Two more. This one? Yeah. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Brilliant. Yes. So um, this, this research topic is speciation genomics. So we're really, really interested in understanding how biodiversity emerges, as you know, many people are. And our target uh, set of species are the so-called guanans. So they're African primates distributed all over Sub-Saharan Africa, and they're extremely diverse. So they have more than 30 species in six genera, uh, and this diversity, um, maybe you can appreciate it here on these, uh, on these uh, images. So this is just a color panel um, made by Jonathan Kingdon, who has a you know, fantastic uh, scientist and uh, artist working in Africa. Uh, so that just shows facial colorations of these species. So, you know, they have these extremely clear facial colors that in any other species would be sufficient for species recognition. And here there as well, so they're used in mating context. They differ very clearly in ecology. So we have some species that live primarily on the trees, they're arboreal, and other species that live primarily on the ground, they're terrestrial. They also differ extremely in karyotypes, having karyotype numbers from 46 to 72 diploid chromosomes. And yet, despite all of these differences, they hybridize, which is absolutely insane. They hybridize in captivity, they also hybridize in the wild. And since they hybridize nowadays, we were interested in understanding if they have hybridized in the past. And this is what my PhD student, Axel Jensen, shown up there, is working on. And indeed, ooh, if that works, maybe. Hello? Ah, now it doesn't like it. Okay. Indeed, when we started studying their genomes, we discovered at least seven independent hybridization events, possibly many, many more, that th these hybridizations are, were ongoing throughout the tree. The red lines are nuclear gene flows, the blue lines are co integrations of mitochondrial genomes that are differentially retained. And you know, with all the complications that go along, where you have to coordinate the action of mitochondrial and nuclear genes for oxidative phosphorylation, and so on and so forth. So we're very excited about that, and I just wanted to give you a teaser about it because I will not be talking about speciation genomics. I will be talking about gorillas. So here we go. And um, as Martin pointed out, one of the big topics in, in our group is conservation genomics. And actually it was triggered by gorillas. We started working with gorillas. Gorillas are critically endangered. So we ended up looking at many aspects that influence their genetic diversity and hopefully with some part may contribute to, uh, you know, facilitate their survival in the future. 
And the people who have done all the work that I will be talking about today are shown here, and many more, in fact. But these are the main people. So part of the work has been done by a former PhD student in the lab, Tom van der Falk, and that will be the first part I will be talking about. And the second project I will be talking about has been driven forward by Markella Moraitu, who was a master student in the lab and has now started a PhD with me, uh, postdoc Adrian Forsyth, and Jella Brayley, who has been a postdoc and who has established the entire methodology in our lab. And we have many collaborators, both on the ground in Africa and in various places uh, in Europe and the world, who have contributed to that. So I'm very, very grateful to them for, for their contribution. Right, so conservation genomics. I don't think I have to remind people here that biodiversity loss is a huge problem. Biodiversity loss is expressed in extinctions and population declines. So these are just you know, some graphs uh, taken from some publications and recent reports. On the left-hand side, you see in red, the rate of mammalian extinction uh, through the last two million years or so, the, the time scale is at the bottom here and it's not linear, but what it shows is that for most of the time, mammalian extinction rates didn't differ, but they dramatically accelerated in the last 250 years or so. So extinctions are a problem. The same goes for population declines. So this is a very recent graph that was presented in the uh, Living Planet Index and summarizes the change in vertebrate populations. So more like almost 32,000 vertebrate populations across more than 5,000 species. And this is the average change in these populations, which is a decline of almost 70%. And these declines and extinctions are widespread taxonomically. They're also widespread uh, geographically, but they affect all branches of life from plants to insects, to mammals, to fish, to amphibians, everything. What are the main drivers of these declines? Agricultural and herbal, herbal, urban development. So deforestation and habitat conversion, basically. Climate change, poaching. And I think this picture here illustrates actually our problem. So here we see a case of extreme conservation, you know, a rhinoceros being guarded by four people while it's feeding on a grass well, like patch of hay, basically. But this level of conservation we cannot allocate to all species that need it. Conservation money is limited, so we need to prioritize. How do we prioritize? So somehow we need to find objective criteria to try and make decisions about where our money should go to if we want to preserve the biological diversity. And that's not trivial and that's not easy. And as scientists, we like to have something objective. And some of the objective criteria that we could use, that we can measure, are, for instance, genetic diversity. And this is because there are many, many studies that show that decline in genetic diversity leads to extinction, leads to uh, reduced reproductive success. Another objective measure would be genetic load or the accumulation of deleterious mutations in the genome. And again, we have really nice examples, many of them showing that fixation of deleterious mutations can lead to extinctions, can lead to decreased reproductive success. So in principle, it seems that we could use these measures, right? We could go out, we could measure genetic diversity, we could measure genetic load, and we could rank species or populations, and then we would prioritize those that rank the highest. But unfortunately, this doesn't quite work out. Um, some of our colleagues have you know, done the exercise and plotted, and, and that has been done many times over, but this is just one of the examples they have plotted genetic diversity here expressed as heterozygosity across the genome against the IUCN conservation status. And we would expect if our understanding was correct, that species that are critically endangered, here shown in red, CR, critically endangered, would have the lowest genetic diversity, where species of least concern would have highest genetic diversity. This is not the case. We basically see no relationship be between the IUCN red list status and genetic diversity. And then, uh, Tom has done another exercise looking at genetic load, and he actually he calculated relative genetic load across different populations and plotted that against the red list conservation status. And again, if our hypothesis was true, we would expect that critically endangered species would have the highest genetic load, would have most deleterious mutations, whereas the species of least concern would have least. But if anything, this relationship is negative, but it's actually, if, if you look at the effect size, it's not, it's not existent. So there's no relationship with that. So we cannot use these markers. So 
if these contemporary comparisons are not informative, so this is where we in estimate the magnitude of present day differences across species or populations, the alternative to that approach would be to use a temporal comparison. This is where we would estimate the magnitude of change through time within a species or a population. And ideally, we would do it across a uh, time period that spans an event. And whatever this event might be, you know, we may know of um, you know, volcanic eruption, and possibly we can assess populations before and after this eruption, uh, things, things along these lines. So that was our hypothesis, and that was that was our approach, and that's that's what we decided to do. And for that, um, obviously, you know, in the absence of time machine, we do the next best thing, and we go to museum collections, because museum collections are these time capsules, and in in fact, they span frequently exactly these two hundred fifty years where most of the change took place. So it allows us to go to the pre-event time period. So now let's move to the gorillas. We decided to do it in one of our favorite species, um, the gorillas, and study the genomic consequences of population decline in these, in these guys. And um, gorillas, I'll give you an introduction because I will be talking about the gorillas a lot. So they have this discontinuous distribution in Central Africa. Most of the gorillas occur in the Western parts of Central Africa. Here shown Western lowland gorillas and their sister species occurs in the eastern parts of Central Africa. And they're divided into two subspecies. So the eastern gorillas are probably those that people know the most thanks to work of Diane Fossey and maybe the book Gorillas in the Mist. They're these mountain gorillas that are probably the best studied gorillas of all, but they're actually a tiny population. And their sister subspecies here in yellow, the grouse gorillas, are actually more abundant, but much less studied. And this is because their distribution range happens to coincide with an area of human tragedy for the last 40 years or so. So they are endemic to the eastern parts of DRC, which has been the epicenter of civil war for the last 40 years. So we know extremely little about these gorillas. What we do know is, oh, was that me? <laughs> Mark. Um, right. What we do know is that the Western gorilla populations are rather abundant, so population sizes number in about 360,000. Mountain gorillas uh, in these tiny two populations have received a lot of conservation support, and thanks to the conservation support, their population sizes have increased to about 1,000. And grouse gorillas number at around 4,000 individuals or so. What we also know is that the grouse gorillas so those DRC endemics have experienced 80% population decline and 60% habitat loss in the last 20 years alone. And for gorillas, as for humans, 20 years is approximately a single generation. So this massive decline within a single generation led to them being classified as critically endangered. So we were interested to see how this massive population decline has affected uh, genetic health, if you like. So what are the consequences, genomically speaking, of these massive population declines? And are these great apes viable in the, in the future? So that's our field site, uh, Forests of DRC, but also this, museum collections. And that allows us to have this temporal comparison um, with using whole genome historical samples and whole genome present day samples. The time difference between these is about 100 years. Um, and that is about four to five gorilla generations. So that's what we're looking at. So using this genomic information, we first obviously looked at genetic diversity. And here I'm just focusing on the Eastern gorillas because I think they're the most interesting comparison. And in these darker colors, you will see uh, estimates for historical populations here and here for grouse gorillas and for mountain gorillas. And in lighter colors, you'll see estimates for present day populations. And what we observe is that indeed, historically, grouse gorillas used to have a considerably high genetic diversity than the, than the present day populations. And this diversity has declined over these four to five generations quite considerably. Right, so, I mean, that's something that we would expect from population decline. Uh, but what was the cause of that? It turns out that primarily it was increase in inbreeding. So we have been looking at runs of homozygosity within the genome. These runs emerge from mating of closely related individuals. And indeed, we observe a significantly higher 
uh, proportion of the genome being in rounds of homozygosity for the modern Brouwer's gorillas compared to historical ones. But this difference is particularly pronounced for the very long rounds of homozygosity, which are indicative of inbreeding within the last few generations. So that's exactly what happened there. And we don't see significant difference for mountain gorillas. And we can talk later about why that is the case. But okay, so we have declining genetic diversity, we have increase in inbreeding, but does it matter? You know, I mean, so these are not good mark, like these are not good things, but does it really matter? And for that, we wanted to look at the functional significance of these changes. And we looked at the uh, deleterious mutations, in this case, loss of function mutations, which would be say premature stop codons rendering proteins non-functional and missense mutations that would change an amino acid in a protein, potentially altering its uh, functionality and making it to some extent non-functional or malfunctional. And we looked at the ratio of these deleterious mutations in modern versus historical populations. And that's what it shows. So if the ratio is one, which is the black line here, there is no difference. But in fact, for both loss of function and missense mutations, we observe a higher number of these mutations in modern genomes compared to their historical counterparts. And we don't see a difference like that in mountain gorillas. And if we look at which genes are affected, so which genes are actually experiencing these deleterious mutations, it would be exactly those that matter. So these are genes involved in immune response and reproductive processes. So we have a very strong indication that these changes that the gorillas have experienced during the course of the last 100 years are actually functionally affecting them and making them less um, stable, evolutionary speaking, and um, you know, redu reducing their evolutionary potential and making them more susceptible. So in terms of prioritizing things, what our study seems to suggest is that it is the grouse gorilla sh that should be receiving the conservation attention and not necessarily the mountain gorillas. And again, we can think about why this is the case. Is it because mountain gorillas have had a small population size, have purged a lot of deleterious mutations, or is it because they have received a lot of conservation attention over the last few decades and that helped them overcome this burden of population declines that were in their past? So taking together, I think one of uh, our kind of take home messages from this project has been that we can actually use this temporal genomics in an informative way for conservation. So we can provide this temporal estimates of genomic change, which can then be used to inform conservation actions and potentially suggest which conservation actions would be more sustainable or more useful in this situation. Would it be simple protection to allow populations to increase in size, selective breeding, translocations, and in turn, these conservation actions, if executed, could that feedback and provide data for a temporal comparison to actually see how well did it work. And the same type of loop, you can argue, goes with rat list assessment status. And of course, this is in turn connected to conservation actions themselves. Right, so that was the conservation genomics part. And now I would like to change gears somewhat and stay with gorillas, stay with museum samples, but talk about microbiomes. And there's a small story behind this because uh, basically the reason we're working on these topics sits here in the room and that's Verena Schunemann. Um, because a number of years ago, Verena contacted me and said, Katja, I know you're working on um, museum collections of gorillas. Have you ever seen dental calculus on them? Like, what? And because we, we looked and we never saw anything that looks anywhere like dental calculus in humans on these gorilla skulls. What we did see was some type of dark film. So we collected this for Verena's project on the evolution of oral microbiome in hominins, uh, but then got interested in it ourselves. So kind of carried on with this idea. And that's Verena, so thanks to you. These are the results of this project. <laughs> Here we go. Right, um, post-associated microbiomes, really interesting and really kind of um, different from free living microbiomes because in contrast to the free living microbiomes there are actually two active forces that um, control or impact host associated microbiomes it is this extrinsic environment say temperature humidity exposure to oxygen but there is also this intrinsic host controls that um, 
primarily driven by immune factors that determine which bacteria are allowed to colonize the host. And while we believe that we're controlling the bacteria, the bacteria are actually controlling us much, much more. And they're involved in a huge variety of really essential biological processes, anywhere from digestion that I suppose everyone is aware of. But they're also involved in behavior, in adaptation, in reproduction. So a lot of things that we rely on is actually only thanks to bacteria. And I hope to give you one more example of where bacteria actually matter. So people have been studying the gut microbiome for a long time, but we decided to go for the oral microbiome. And the question is why? So why is oral microbiome interesting or relevant? Well, it kind of sits at this intersection between the internal environments and the external environments. And it is intimately connected to the respiratory and digestive tract, yet it receives input directly from the outside, right? I mean. Every time we speak, every time we breathe, every time we eat, we get stuff from the outside into our mouth. Um, oral microbiome is driver of oral and systemic diseases, uh, anywhere from diabetes to cancer to Alzheimer to preterm birth. And it could potentially contribute to local, local adaptation specifically because of its interconnection to the outside. That's what we believe, at least. So we decided to kind of look at this, um, but primarily we were concerned with like a set of big questions because, again, the oral microbiome hasn't been studied super well. Um, what we know about what shapes it is that um, changes in diet will cause differences in the oral microbiome. For example, when infants mature, the oral microbiome changes, and that might be the result of changes in diet. We also know from our previous comparative work that species differ in their microbiomes. So if you look at such different species as gorillas, reindeer, bears, they will have different microbiomes. So we kind of have this dual influence of the environment that happens, say, depending on the diet or ecological conditions, but also something that suggests a co-evolution between the microbiome and the host. So which one is it? And we're not exactly sure. So again, you know, we turn to our favorite study species, the gorillas, and we thought it is a really good study species because there are differences in divergence times. So we have our Western gorillas that have split from the Eastern gorillas anywhere between a million and 150,000 years ago. There are debate on that, and Martin will tell you more about the timing, but there are different values in the literature. But then we have these two extremely closely related Eastern gorilla subspecies that split from each other anywhere between 10 and 14,000 years ago. So very, very close. They're geographically very close, whereas the Western gorillas are on the other side. But also these gorilla taxa, they differ from each other ecologically. So the Western lowland gorillas, hence the name, live at low altitudes. So they live below 500 meters above sea level. And because of their habitat, they actually have quite a lot of fruit in their diet. So they're the most forgivers of all. On the other side, on the other extreme, are the mountain gorillas, hence the name. They live in the mountains at very high altitude, usually above 2,000 meters. And due to their habitat, they have extremely little fruit in their diet. It's not that they don't like it. They would eat it. They just, it's just not available in their habitat. And then we have the gravis gorillas, which actually span the entire altitudinal range between the two. So if we think back of our research question and try to see, is it host phylogeny? So is it the co-evolution with the host? Or is it the host ecology that is primarily shaping the oral microbiome? It seems this would be a good system to answer it. Because if it is host phylogeny, we should see closer similarity between these two closely related and geographically proximate species. Whereas if it is host ecology, we might actually see somewhat intermediate profiles in these gravis gorillas. Um, and probably the extremes in the mountain and Western lowland gorillas. And I'm checking the time to make sure I'm not running over. Right. Okay, so we went for dental calculus. I probably don't need to tell you about dental calculus. It's a calcified form of oral microbiome. It doesn't look anything like the human example here on gorillas. It's a black biofilm, but in the same way as the human um, oral microbiome or dental calculus, it consists of 90% of bacteria, but it also captures dietary remains and it captures host cells, allowing us to study all of these aspects from the same source of material. And that's what we did in this project and some of it I will show today. So first things first, we focused on this um, bacterial component, and we were interested to see if we will detect any differences between the subspecies. And we're really actually positively surprised and happy, because it allowed us to carry on with the project, that we found 
um, both by looking at taxonomic composition of the oral microbiome and at the functional profiles, we actually found a very strong signature of the subspecies. So this, this plot here shows the PCA analysis with our different gorilla taxa. And this is a permanova analysis that tests uh, for different contributing factors. And for example, we included read counts, we included data sets because we had two data sets to be combined. And none of these factors was significant, but the subspecies was. And that was true for both taxonomic compositions so of which taxa are there and for their functional profiles. So great stuff, but which taxa do differ? Because that is our key question. And it turns out that mountain gorillas were different from everyone else, whereas the grouse gorillas, despite being close evolutionary relatives of the mountain gorillas, and despite the close geographic proximity, were actually indistinguishable from Western lowland gorillas that lived across the Congo Basin on the other side of Africa. So that was uh, the first kind of surprise, fine. We then decided to look at differential abundant taxa, and to see where the differences are, and started realizing that, in fact, grouse gorillas, although being more similar to Western lowland, are somewhat intermediate. So grouse gorillas are here, and we have a number of like, different taxa where grouse gorillas look very much like the Western lowland gorillas, but we also have sets of taxa where they look very much like mountain gorillas. And because we could quantify, um, not quantify, qualitatively assess diet from the same material, because diet from dental calculus is a nightmare, but we did a similar type of approach and found the same type of pattern. So again, these are our grouse gorillas. And again, they have signatures of Western lowland and signatures of mountain gorillas. So they're intermediate there. When we zoom in a little bit and try to understand what are these taxa that are shared between ones and the others, here's a very interesting example. And in particular, we found Rhizobialis, which is not an oral taxon at all. This is a group of bacteria that actually happens to live on the roots of plants. And we believe that this is something that the gorillas ingest when they ingest root material and rhizome material. And it's interesting to see that in this particular case, Western lowland and grouse gorillas have these taxa present in the dental calculus where they're completely absent from mountain gorillas. And although there is no comparative data on the proportions and magnitude of root and rhizome consumption in these different gorilla species, there's anecdotal evidence and many reports of consumption of roots and rhizomes in Western lowland and grouse gorillas and very few in mountain gorillas. There's also evidence from toothware so from microscopic toothware patterns that suggest that Western lowland and grouse gorillas would consume more of these root species than mountain gorillas do. So be it as it may, I think this gives us the first hint that there is this influence of the environment that impacts the oral microbiome. Right. Um, I also mentioned that these grouse gorillas span the magnitude of altitudinal ranges between the gorilla subspecies. So we decided to make use of that. And in our data uh, set, unfortunately, we did have some Western lowland gorillas that overlapped in altitude with Western gorillas. But the high altitude, the highest altitude from which we had our grouse gorilla sample um, was still below what we got for mountain gorillas. So there's still a gap of about a thousand meters here, but still we decided to subdivide our grouse gorillas in low altitude and high altitude growers and to see if maybe it is this altitude and whatever is associated with this altitude that explains these differences and drives these differences between the subspecies. And in fact, when we did that, we observed what I think you know, is probably explaining our data. So when we look at differentially abundant microbial taxa, we see that grouse gorillas from high altitudes do not differ from mountain gorillas. Grouse gorillas from low altitudes do not differ from Western lowland gorillas, but everything else is different. Um, and the same goes for diet. It's the same type of pattern. So it seems when we start grouping the grouse gorillas by altitude, altitude appears to be explaining the differences that we observe. Right. And I will come to the final part of the story, which I think is actually the most exciting one. Um, when we work with these metagenomes, particularly from museum samples, from species and sources that are not well described, we're relying very much on mapping the reads against the known database. And that's quite limiting, and this is quite biased, because if you don't have your favorite taxon represented in the database, you will not find it in your data. 
So an alternative approach is metagenome assembled genomes, so trying or attempting to reconstruct the genomes of the taxa that are there from the data directly. And um, we have done this for, for this gorilla study, and we have reconstructed a bunch of these metagenomic assembled genomes. And among them, I will talk about one specific one, Neisseria. Neisseria is a typical oral bacterium. It's quite abundant in gorillas. That's why it's possible to reconstruct a mag, so a metagenome assembled genome. And the first thing that you do, you kind of place this MAC in a phylogenetic context, and you try to understand what is this MAC. And here it is in, in red, shown here, uh, placed in the phylogeny of many different described Neisseria species. And it seems to be an independent lineage, probably something that has not been characterized yet, which is unsurprising. You know, we're working with gorillas, not with humans. Um, it also clusters with a set of MACs that have been isolated exclusively from humans, whereas there are other branches of this tree that contain isolates from some other uh, vertebrate species um, here. But what is actually interesting about Neisseria is the following. So Neisseria is involved in nitrogen metabolism. And nitrogen metabolism is, as it turned out, a quite important thing because we as humans rely on bacteria to provide us or to metabolize nitrogen that we ingest in our food. So the way it works is following. We ingest nitrogen or nitrate-rich food. For example, sim symbolized here as a beetroot juice, which turns out to be a very good source of nitrate. So whoever wants that, I recommend. So we ingest this nitrate-rich food. It goes into our gut. And in this gut, we can turn nitrate into nitrite. So nitrite, which is this O2, uh, sorry, so not O3, uh, NO3, but NO2. So nitrite then is being, no, sorry, I mixed it up. <laughs> I have to step back. No, we cannot actually metabolize it. So we ingest ni nitrate, it goes into the gut, and from there we cannot metabolize it at all, but it's being given up to the blood, and from the blood it's, given, uh, it's, it's being transported into saliva. And in saliva, it is being offered to the oral bacteria, which actually make the transition, the reduction of nitrate into nitrite. So from NO3 to NO2, that happens in our mouth. We cannot do it ourselves. Then, once it is produced by the oral bacteria, we swallow it back again, and in the stomach this time, we can metabolize nitrite into nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, turns out, is an extremely valuable molecule because it is involved in um, respiratory health, it is involved in your sport performance, it is involved in cardiovascular pressure, and it is involved in high altitude adaptation. So much so that the nitric oxide percentage in Sherpas is much, much higher than in lowland populations. And that is in absence of increased red blood cell count. So we were quite intrigued by that and we thought, wow, okay, so here we have something that's involved in high altitude adaptation that's present in our gorillas. Wait a sec, we have a bunch of gorillas from high altitudes. Could there be a connection? So we decided to look at the abundance of this Neisseria uh, bacterium that we recovered in our data, and we realized that actually mountain gorillas have a considerably higher abundance of this Neisseria than Western lowland or Grauas gorillas. So that was quite intriguing, but Thankfully, we have the MAC, so we can actually do a little bit more than just kind of an indicative study. We can look at the presence of nitrate-reducing genes in this one genome. So that's what we decided to do then. And for Neisseria, they're quite well known. So we have um, then looked in our reconstructed genome and checked for the presence of genes that are involved in nitrogen metabolism. And everything that's blue is a gene being present, and everything that's whatever it is, salmon, is the gene being absent. Um, so our mag is here, and with the exception of two genes, everything else is present, and actually these genes, these two genes that are absent, are not essential for nitrate metabolism of this bacteria. So taking together, I think we have at least an indication in the absence of you know, experimental work with this particular bacterium isolated from gorilla mouth, we have an indication that Mountain gorillas that live at high altitudes 
have an increased presence of bacteria that are involved in nitrogen metabolism that are producing nitric oxide, which is involved in high altitude adaptation. And that's quite exciting because so far, not a single study that was trying to find evidence for high altitude adaptation in mountain gorillas has been successful, including our own attempts. We have been digging in these genomes for such a long time in the hope to be finding something that will explain how they survive in high altitudes. We found nothing. So I think that's why I'm really excited about this thing, because it's the first evidence that we have about a mechanism of adaptation to high altitude um, in these species. Right. And with this, I am coming to the conclusions. Um, so in this particular project, we have looked at closely related gorilla taxa, and our data indicates that phylogenetic relationships and geographical proximity are actually less important for structuring this oral microbiome than ecological differences. And I think that's very exciting, particularly for the oral microbiome, because that's the one that is going to receive most of the input from the outside. Um, so these differences that we observe among subspecies might be driven by diet and or the environment. So, you know, our examples of the rhizome associated taxa that we have observed in the dental calculus. And the question there is, are they truly part of the oral microbiome? Do they play a structural role? Are they transitory? We don't know. And finally, I think we are, you know, on the way of finding more and more evidence for bacteria contributing to host adaptations. And in this case, I talked about the nitrogen metabolism of Neisseria in the mountain gorillas. Right. So with this, I'm coming to the close and... Um, I would like to thank you for your attention, but I would also really want to acknowledge the amazing natural history collections that we have used for this work that allowed us to sample the gorillas and their, sample, uh, their specimens, and obviously the funding sources that have contributed to this work. So thanks again. Uh, thank you, Katya. And so I mean, we're open for questions also from the online audience, of course. Um, but yeah, so questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the genetic uh, diversity in gorillas. And uh, do you have a clue? Uh, what is the difference? Uh, what is the difference of uh, diversity co uh, quotient uh, between lowland and mountain gorillas, for example, mm. because west, these are west and lowland. two edges. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I didn't, I didn't present this data, uh, and I probably should have. Yes, so western lowland gorillas are considerably more genetically diverse than the eastern gorillas, both mountain and grouse gorillas. And that also makes sense given the A, present high population size and their historical large population size. Mm -hmm. And according to the uh, microbiome uh, stuff, um, it is it is uh, what they eat. So, <laughs> and they are adapted to uh, a specific environmental constraints, the lowland or the, the the mountain gorillas. So, what is the difference in uh, some uh, uh, nutritional factors mm -hmm. in their diet? Because they are adapted on it. Possibly it is not the altitude. It is the altitude mm -hmm. because there is a, the altitude a structures yeah, the diet, exactly, but it is yeah. the exactly. Yes, a super valuable question. We actually have uh, another project where we looked at the gut microbiome and dietary components from the fecal samples, which are much much easier and mm -hmm. more you know yeah. forward, straightforward to work with than dietary components from dental calculus, which is a nightmare. Uh, but um, Simple question, we don't have comparative studies of nutritional content of typical Western lowland gorilla foods, mountain gorilla foods, mm -hmm. grouse gorilla foods. We have good understanding of what it is that mountain gorillas eat, so that has been explored quite well. Uh, we know that they tend to select protein-rich uh, parts of the vegetation that they consume. Um, we also know that Western lowland gorillas have a much higher proportion of fruit in their diet, which would supposedly be enriched in simple sugars. Um, 
but comparatively speaking, we don't know. So in this case, you're absolutely right. And that's, that's, where, that's where we stand as well. We know it is the food, but which component of the food is it that determines or you know, structures the oral microbiome, we can't say at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, yeah, I guess for that one would need to bring some growers, gorillas to high altitude and <laughs> feed them the same diet and then <laughs> transplant into some Dinaseria um, micro biome and in others not and then you can compare right absolutely i mean maybe simple. A bit difficult to implement. <laughs> easy to do thank you for the engaging talk um so i was wondering you so in those studies i'm not quite sure like so i think that the data that you now presented was from modern gorillas right like the modern populations or Hello. For, for the oral microbiome now. Yeah. No, so this is all taken from museum specimens. So they are okay. all around, say, you know, eight, but 40 to 100 years old. And were those populations the same at the time? Like, uh, mm -hmm. are they constant or like, you mm -hmm. know, did they have like larger so, populations? Yeah. And no, did so, that I mean, influence them? Exactly. Results? So that's that's a good question. So we, we know we know for a fact that, of course, grouse gorilla populations have declined, right? So, I mean, so that's that was the first part of our study. Um, they, they have declined, um, however, um, so what we also know, so another part that I didn't show you is that uh, some of the grouse gorilla populations that are represented in our museum collections do not exist any longer. They went extinct. And with them went extinct a number of mitochondrial haplotypes, for instance, so we have a huge uh, loss or you know extirpation of mitochondrial diversity. Um, we have a decline in genetic, in nuclear genetic diversity. Um, we do, however, have a, a large proportion of the museum specimens that have been collected are from populations that are existent today as well. So I have to admit that we didn't look at differences between those populations that went extinct and those populations that still persist. We didn't look at this aspect of the data, maybe because we kind of assume that maybe they don't change so much, but that's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a naive assumption. You know, I, I think it's a super valid question. We just didn't consider it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. Uh, just like a tiny little um, addition in con conservation, usually, like mm -hmm. in general, are there just out of interest because you've worked on, on this uh, topic. So um, are there species that are considered beyond uh, conservation? <laughs> like what what point do you consider like the at the what point do you, like to do you give up? Okay, that's sort of interesting. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's a very very interesting philosophical question. Um, maybe maybe I can give you an example of vankita. I don't know if vankita is a is a term. If everyone knows what it is, so it's it's basically it's a it's a tiny dolphin, if you like. So it's a cetacean uh, that lives uh, around Mexico and has been on the verge of extinction for the last, I don't know, 30, 50, 60 years or so. And when I say on the verge of extinction, as far as we know, there are six individuals left in the wild. And there were a bunch of um, conservation programs being implemented for Vankita, uh, trying to rescue them. The problem is if you capture them and try to breed them in captivity, they die. So all these conservation uh, attempts brought nothing except to increase the rate of extinction and the death of these, these Vankitas. Um, a group of researchers in the United States decided to sequence basically every single Vankita that's left. It's not that many, right? I mean, six. Uh, so it's not a huge effort. And they found that despite this extremely small population size that has been small, I mean, not six, but has been in, in a number of dozens uh, for a while now, they have a really high genetic diversity and they do not have a huge load of deleterious mutations, possibly because the populations have been small for a while, they have purged deleterious mutations. So from the genetic perspective or genomic perspective, they're actually genomically healthy. It's just that if the six individuals do not manage to reproduce, we lost them. So the question of where do we draw the line, where do we say, is it worth uh, conserving them or not, is a, you know, I mean, it's partly scientific, partly political, and partly philosophical. So as a, some, a person who's involved in conservation genetics, 
I, it, it's very difficult to say, okay, you know, just don't do it any longer. Let's let's put let's put our effort elsewhere. What, what I am firm and have a very clear position is de-extinction. So, <laughs> so putting this limited conservation money into trying to resurrect species that went extinct instead of trying to save species that are currently alive, this is crossing the red line for me. But yeah. Um, thank you for this for this great talk. Um, I have two questions. One is, I think I missed this point at the very beginning when you said um, that genetic diversity sort of has no connection to the critically endangered. Mm -hmm. Is this a general thing or was mm -hmm. this only for, for the gorillas or? No, so this particular slide that they showed was for mammalian species. It has been replicated. So this, this type of assessments mm -hmm. trying to link estimates of genetic diversity and red lake conservation status has been replicated in many different species. And the result Results are usually, with a small, a small caveat, which I'll tell in a sec, are usually the same, that there's very little connection between estimates of genetic diversity and uh, ratless status. There's reason for that, and it's because the ratless status in their assessment, they don't take genetic diversity into account. What they look at is the rate of population decline. If population decline happens extremely fast, it's usually not enough time to eradicate or er er erose or no, er yeah reduce genetic diversity. Um, it will be reduced, but it will not be removed completely. So that's where the temporal component is actually quite helpful. The that, so the little caveat that I wanted to mention is that when people start looking at specific clades, so instead of saying we consider all mammals or we consider all vertebrates or we consider all living organisms, they start saying we will consider primates of this particular genus and we will do comparative estimates of genetic diversity across the species in this genus. That's when people start usually seeing a small signature of correlation between genetic diversity and conservation status. If that answers your question, yeah. Uh -huh. And the second question is, do you have any behavioral correlates? I mean, maybe social behavior correlates to, to the specific, I mean, to the components or to the differences in diets you find in this room? Mm. And that you could just... Yeah, so correlating diet and social behavior is, I mean, it has, has been obviously done, right? So when we think about scramble competition, we think about territoriality, when we think about group size and things like that. Um, connecting it specifically to particular dietary aspects becomes somewhat difficult because the habitat is not homogeneous, right? Yeah. So the habitat is different. So I don't have a good answer for that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Probably there's no straightforward answer. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. Thanks for this super exciting talk. Um, I have a question because you mentioned that the Gawa gorillas were just, uh, no, the, the mountain gorillas were just 1,000, mm -hmm. but they are more healthy genetically, less deleterious mm -hmm. genes. Do you have an explanation? I mean, you just mentioned your six... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I do adult dolphins, but is there any? Is this pure chance, or what is it? No, no, no. It's not. Let me see. I actually have a slide to show you something, and it is. Yeah, I mean, I like I have twenty thousand of them. <laughs> Here we go. Um, let's see. So. First of all, they're not more genetically healthy. So actually they have lower genetic diversity than the Grauas gorillas and they have a higher proportion of deleterious uh, alleles than the Grauas gorillas. But what, we, what is less is the rate of change. So basically from 100, 120 years ago until today, the situation for mountain gorillas didn't get worse, whereas the situation for Grauas gorillas did get worse dramatically. So the situation is worse, is bad, but it didn't change. It didn't change, exactly. But the reason for that, so that's why I put up this, this slide. The reason for that is the following. So we think that demography explains it quite well. So here in this, in this first thing, we're looking at PSMC plot, so uh, demographic change through time for a huge chunk of time. So we're looking at more than 1 million years in the past, and grouse gorillas are in yellow, mountain gorillas are in gray, and they kind of follow each other. So there's no difference. But what is uh, important is that from about, say, 200, 300,000 years ago, we see continuous population decline in both. And this continuous population decline and continuously low effective population sizes usually lead, if, if they're slow, 
if they're not rapid, they usually lead to purging of deleterious alleles because you would have, you know, closely related individuals mating with each other, exposing deleterious alleles, which will be then removed by selection because their offspring are not fit, right? And this way they will be removed from the population. And because it's a slow and soft process, you don't get a population extinction, but you get the purging. So, so far they, they're identical. What then happens is that mountain gorillas actually remain in low population size for an extended period of time. So they're here, so we have a flat out of their demographic history. So again, from the past to the present, whereas grouse gorillas, about 5,000 years ago, they experienced a population growth. So we believe that happens when mountain gorillas and grouse gorillas split from each other, and the grouse gorillas went down to, from the mountains into the lowland forests of the Eastern Congo. And forest expanded at that time, so there was space and there was food and the population expanded. And we believe this has actually created a problem for them because populations have expanded, they started to be more genetically diverse, they accumulated more deleterious mutations that have never been exposed to selection because the population is large and the deleterious mutations have never been in a homozygous state. Now we have population collapse. So that's, oh, sorry, uh, what do I need to do? I need to, no? Uh, like this? Exactly. So now we have this population collapse. So again, this is from the past to the present, where grouse gorillas went through an extreme bottleneck, losing 80% of their population. But mountain gorillas, they had a decline in the 80s, but thanks to the conservation efforts, they recovered quite quickly. And you can see the population sizes are quite different for the two. But this tiny short-lived bottleneck and the rapid recovery we think is what helped them to not lose even more genetic diversity and not, not obtain even more deleterious mutations than they already had, along with long-term low effective populations. Does it answer your question? Kind of? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about the last thing, if oh. I understood it, but the rest was very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, that, just one, one little question. The absolute decline here at 200,000 years, is there any explanation because that was not humans? No. I assume. I mean, there were yeah. anatomically yeah. modern humans already yeah. in Africa, but yeah. they're probably not responsible for that. What was it? So at some point um, around here, and again, you know, the, the exact timing is debated, um, Eastern and Western gorillas split from each other. So this is population separation. It is also believed that gorillas originated in the West where the large population exists, and they basically moved into the Eastern parts of Africa. So that was basically a bottleneck of their settlement in Africa. And then there were um, uh, climatic events that confined them to the, to the tops of the mountains to where the forests were still persistent. So they have obligate forest dwellers. They need forests. They don't do well in the savanna, and they needed to follow the forest and the forest contracted at that time. So that's what we think, and particularly in the eastern part of Africa. So that's what we think has happened. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, we have well, two questions from the online audience, but I think the first question, which Amira asked, um, how the low loss of function mutations in modern gorillas compared to historical mountain gorillas, how that can be explained, but that was actually the answer that yeah, you just gave. Exactly. That it's mm -hmm. the um, relative change that mm -hmm. didn't exactly. happen. Exactly, exactly. Um, and there's another question from Hilke. Um, fantastically interesting, especially the NO3 to NO cycle. Presumably, zoo populations of mountain gorilla would provide a good check on Nyseria. Seems like an easy assumption that most zoos are at low altitude locations. Aha, yes. So, would make sense if there's indeed no signature at all of co-evolution between the host and the, uh, the oral microbiome. Um, that's actually a really good, good idea. So if it is purely diet, then indeed we should, we should see, relatively speaking, lower proportions of Neisseria and other nitrate-reducing bacteria uh, in zoo mountain gorillas than in the wild. However, there is not a single mountain gorilla in the zoo because they don't survive in captivity. That's, uh, that's the downside. There is a single grouse gorilla in a zoo in Antwerp, I believe and all the other zoo gorillas are Western lowland. So we don't have a good study system to look at it, but yeah. Have they been like, I mean, if they have been captured, 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 
if people tried to drag mountain gorillas into a zoo and they just didn't survive and then their remains left somewhere yeah um i'm not aware of those to be quite honest i think uh so but i then know they would have the wild microbiome no if they so, just died there no so the thing is so what we know for sure is that the microbiome changes dramatically in captivity right and particularly if we believe that diet influences, it should be changing it quite strongly. We're actually currently uh, initiating a project, which will be coming back to Vienna to sample, <laughs> but looking at uh, domesticated and uh, wild animals from historical collections as well. Um, for the gut microbiome, there are quite a lot of studies showing that the microbiome becomes more simple, dominated by a subset of taxa and uh, shifts uh, dramatically in primates uh, in captive primates it becomes humanized so it shifts if you if you were to project it on a bca it becomes more human-like uh, and kind of shifts from the wild state towards the westernized diet human populations yeah mm -hmm. yeah but really good questions this this is really fun yeah thanks so much Good. Um, yes, so I think that's it for today. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Katya, for the great talk and <laughs> the great question and answer session. And yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot.